Hello and welcome again to Temple Talks. Today, we are honored to have with us Mr. Franz Timmerman, the Executive Vice President of European Commission and the Commissioner for European Green Deal. Mr. Timmermans is visiting Indonesia for two days on October 18 to 19. He has some objectives to be brought to the meeting with the Indonesian government official and the civil society organization. However, it's no secret that the relationship between the EU and the Indonesia has not always been smooth. For example, currently Indonesia has a conflict with the EU on the issue of nickel ore export. And the matter of oil palm still creates tense relationship between the two sides. So Mr. Timmerman, what exactly your objective in your visit to Indonesia? Well, my first objective is to enhance the bilateral relationship between the European Union and Indonesia. We have many common challenges. Uh, we are far apart, but close together in terms of policy. Uh, Indonesia is going to lead the G20 uh, shortly. That's very important to us. And Indonesia is an important player at the uh, upcoming COP26 conference in Glasgow on the climate crisis. So I have many, many reasons uh, to visit Indonesia. You've met with the president, right? President Jokowi. Yes. So what's the result of the meeting? I think we uh, had a lot in common. Um, Indonesia has been doing a tremendous amount of work on improving its natural environment, mm -hmm. on finding nature-based solutions for the climate crisis. Uh, the president uh, told me about uh, his visit uh, to Kalimantan tomorrow in the mangroves, uh, and we discussed uh, what more could be done to improve our natural environment. We also discussed one of those issues that have always caused some discussion between the EU and Indonesia, which is uh, vegetable oils. Uh, and uh, I want to make sure we improve our relationship because the EU will remain a huge importer of palm oil. Uh, but we want to work with Indonesia to make sure that palm oil becomes uh, fully sustainable. And with the moves uh, to counter deforestation that the government has taken, I'm optimistic about the possibilities to improve that. always become the hot issue between the EU and Indonesia. Right? Yeah, well, in Indonesia, if you mention the EU, people, ah, yes, palm oil. Palm oil uh, right. <laughs> so we need to make sure that palm oil is an opportunity for both the EU and Indonesia and not a bone of contention. So do you think that the uh, palm oil industry is not uh, quite sustainable? Well, there are many European consumers are worried about the effects uh, of palm oil cultivation on deforestation. Uh, so if Indonesia is co continues with its move to prevent deforestation and to protect uh, uh, their forests and to protect the mangroves, then we can have a different discussion about palm oil because then palm oil becomes step-by-step -step a sustainable product. And we also need to look after the interest of, of the many, many small farmers. Right. Because there a lot of people think that uh, farmers will lose their jobs or they lost their, uh, the crops because of the policy of the EU. Well, yes, I think that is, but there are misconceptions. The EU still is a massive importer of Indonesian palm oil. It's not that we want to block that, no. We want to improve the quality of the palm oil in dialogue with the Indonesian government so that palm oil does not lead to deforestation and that there is 
such a thing as sustainable palm oil, which we will need in our food. Right. So it's not the act of protectionism as people think. <laughs> no, but, but, but there is a serious, a serious and genuine concern right. with European consumers that palm oil might lead to deforestation. Right. You know, we see it in other areas as well. With soya beans, it's the same discussion. So I, I need to be able to say to European consumers, we will make sure that the palm oil we import is sustainable and Indonesia is taking measures to protect the primal forests. Is it also become the hot issue in the negotiation of Indonesia-AU Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement? Well, it's always an issue. This is always an issue and uh, I've uh, come here also to try and find a common way through. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this is what we agreed also with, uh, because the foreign minister was there as well and the trade minister was also in the meeting. So we agreed to pursue this and to continue our dialogues on this and I promised that we would inform Indonesia and consult Indonesia on any changes in legislation we might have on uh, on uh, uh, the uh, quality of our renewable energy. Right, That's, there is also an obstacle about the nickel ore export issue, right? So is it also become one of the hot issues in the negotiations? Um, no, I don't think so. I think, I think there are, of course, we, we haven't progressed in the negotiations as far as I would wish and as far as the Indonesian government would wish. So we need to make more progress. But there are no issues that are unsolvable. All issues can be tackled. You're optimistic. I'm optimistic, yes. <laughs> okay. yes. Pada saat ini dan akan datang, korporasi sangat membutuhkan SDM yang mampu beradaptasi dengan dunia bisnis yang serba digital termasuk kegiatan pemasaran. Untuk itu, kami hadir dengan membuka program studi manajemen pemasaran internasional yang akan dikuatkan dengan pembelajaran lokal culture di banyak negara. Kurikulum dirancang dinamis mengikuti perkembangan dunia kerja dan dunia usaha yang bergerak begitu cepat. Tempo Media Group sebagai penyelenggara pendidikan berpengalaman di industri media dengan reputasi tinggi selama lebih dari 50 tahun. Para pengajar dari kalangan praktisi akan mendidik mahasiswa program studi manajemen pemasaran internasional untuk siap bekerja di dunia profesional. Kurikulum Politeknik Tempo berbasis keahlian terapan dengan muatan 60% praktik yang didukung fasilitas Smart Campus dengan digitalisasi sistem belajar. Mahasiswa berkesempatan praktek kerja langsung di lebih dari 20 perusahaan di lingkungan Tempo Media Group dan Mitra Politeknik Tempo. Lulusan Sarjana Terapan Manajemen disiapkan untuk berprofesi menjadi Marketing Planner, Digital Marketer, Konsultan Pemasaran, Customer Relation Management, dan juga Entrepreneur yang berorientasi pasar global. Ray masa depan cerah bersama Politeknik Tempo dengan belajar di program Studi Manajemen Pemasaran Internasional. Jadilah Profesional Marketer baru di era digital. Mari menjadi bagian dari keluarga besar Empower yang kreatif, mandiri, dan siap kerja. the bid for 50 legislative proposal package, right? To achieve the greenhouse emission cut of 55%. Yes. 
by 2030 exactly. compared yes. to 1999, yes. right? So yes. how you will implement it? I mean, it's like, can you explain it and how you will implement it? Well, it's gradually or well, simultaneously? The, the, the first step we took is to say we want to be the first climate neutral continent in 2050. And we will set that into law. Now, to get there, we need to also have a goal for 2030. And we said, if we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions with at least 55% as compared to 1990 by 2030, then we can reach climate neutrality in 2050. And we decided to put that into law. So it's binding on all member states and on the EU institutions. Now, after that, I presented a package of 13 pieces of legislation that either amend existing legislation or introduce new legislation on issues such as the need to reduce emissions of cars. Uh, we will have zero emission cars built in Europe as of 2035, only zero emission cars. So um, uh, as the energy efficiency of buildings, as uh, the issue of the transition to renewable energy, uh, on all these issues, we have now proposed legislation. And if we implement that legislation, we can get to the minus 55 in 2030. So. There will that will be done with, uh, simultaneously, right? Yes. Uh, Thirteen. Yes. Like this lesson. <laughs> Indeed. So it's a big overall. It's a lot of work. So what's the impact to the countries out of the EU? Well, it depends on whether the countries take similar measures, also move towards uh, uh, carbon neutrality in the decades uh, to come. Okay. And it, dep it also de depends on the level of development of countries because we want to make sure we help developing countries also become more ambitious. Um, and uh, those countries that are developed and don't take decarbonizing uh, measures, they might be affected by what we call a carbon border adjustment mechanism, which means that we would uh, make sure that industry that produces in Europe does not leave Europe to go and produce somewhere else uh, um, where the uh, requirements would be less strict. So it will be really hard for the country south of EU, right? Especially the Asia or Indonesia. <laughs> it no, will I, be quite expensive to implement it. I don't think so, because it, it's going to be much more expensive to do nothing. If, if we let things get out of hand mm -hmm. and we would overshoot the two degrees uh, mark, mm -hmm. then, you know, we would see failed harvests all the time. We would see wildfires. We would see thunderstorms. And that is much, much more costly than the cost of a transition uh, to a sustainable economy. So, EU has a commitment to help other countries, especially the developing countries, to achieve that goal? Yes, and we have agreed in the UN that the developed countries would uh, put on the table 100 billion euros, uh, sorry, dollars, 100 billion dollars a year for adaptation and mitigation. Uh, uh, in the uh, of the climate crisis, the European Union has now put on the table one third of that one hundred billion dollars. So now we're asking other rich countries to also be more ambitious and put money on the table. The Americans have said they would put eleven point four billion on the table. We will keep urging others to also do that so that we reach uh, what we have promised to the developing world, which is one hundred billion dollars uh, by twenty twenty. How to apply the green policy or programs in living in a country or a developing country in easy and less expensive ways? Well, I think there's, there's things we all uh, can do. I think uh, a country like Indonesia could profit from what we call nature-based solutions okay. uh, by, well, like the president is doing with the mangroves, but also the marine environment, uh, making the sea cleaner and leaving it alone for a while mm -hmm. so that it can recover, uh, looking at... Uh, uh, the way agriculture is, is being implemented, but also investing in uh, renewable energy because renewable energy is much, much cheaper than fossil fuels. It's also there is a focus from the EU for the renewable energy in Indonesia. Well, Indonesia, I mean, you have so much sun. Right. You <laughs> have geothermal energy. You have wind almost everywhere. It would be, it would be a no-brainer. It would be logical for Indonesia to massively invest in renewable energy because renewable energy also now in the energy crisis you see the price of gas has gone up the price of coal has gone up but renewable energy have has remained cheap 
And that is, in, if I can offer renew, uh, electricity yeah. from renewable energy to my citizens, I can offer cheap energy to them. But if there is a green transition, when um, there is like a greener industry, especially in the manufacturer, I think that um, people afraid that they will lose the jobs or uh, there is an increase of unemployment. Well, you know, a transition is always difficult if you transit from one situation to another. But in Europe, we have calculated that in the new economy, there are two million new jobs. So transiting to a new economy also comes with a lot more new job opportunities. Of course, the problem is not just the economy needs to transit, the people also. So people need different skills uh, than they have in the present jobs. And I believe public authorities have responsibility to help citizens acquire the skills so that they can be successful in the new economy. What's the crucial topic for EU in the Glasgow COP? What I want to achieve in that conference is that we, at the end of the conference, we can say we are still on Paris territory. We're still well below two degrees. We still have a shot at 1.5. Now, that is what I would like to see come out of this. For that, we need countries to be more ambitious on the reduction of their emissions. We need the $100 billion uh, on the table, and we need clear agreements on the rules of the game. If we can achieve those three things, then we will still have a shot at the Paris Agreement. Okay. Do you implement green living in your daily life? I try as much as possible. Why? Uh, what? Uh, well, I now have, for instance, uh, for several reasons, I have a service car. That's an electric car. Uh, it's no longer a combustion engine car. I try and use my bike as, as much as I can. Uh, we try and save energy in our home, uh, my wife and kids and I. Uh, we try and move around with public transport if we can. Uh, on shorter distances, we don't fly anymore. We take the train. So that sort of thing is what we do. Okay, thank you, Mr. Thermerman. It was a pleasure. I'm Prabandari. You can watch the next Tempo Talks next month with another interesting topics and another interesting guest.